The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. Here again is Dr. Barnhouse with a message entitled, Why Did God Save You? Part 1. I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Five times in this book, the phrase, the heavenly places, is to be found. The heavenly places, the heavenly places. The five verses show, first, that we're living at Philadelphia, and that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, and that in the highest, highest heavens, God raised Christ and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above the principalities and powers, and that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. And we saw last Sunday that God Almighty counts us as being ascended into heaven and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Now in chapter 3 and verse 10, he says this amazing verse, to the intent, that is for the purpose, in order to show, in order to do, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. In fundamental circles, I believe that too low an impression of the church is given. There are people in fundamental circles who get the idea that the church is unimportant, that it's possible for you to go here and there and here and there and consider the church as a hotel where you can drop in for a meal and then go to another hotel and another restaurant and just go round from place to place. You cannot find this idea in the Word of God. The church was a place where someone came and where they made their church home and where they were linked together and where in love they worked together and that the church really means a body of people who are gathered together to be built together, to know each other, to share our mutual woes and bear our mutual burdens and in love to show the world outside that when Christ brought people together, that it was that which fused their lives into a oneness that could not be known in any other way. Now, the purpose of this is given in chapter 3 and verse 10. We live in a world that crucified Christ. We live in a world whose motto, you might say, is every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. The world says, what's his angle? What's he got in it? What am I going to get out of it? What's there in it for me? The Christian lives in that kind of a world and must be outgoing, giving, serving. The thought must always be, how can I honor the Lord? What can I do for him? What can I do for others? To see Jesus in every person in this world who's miserable and poor, Yes, to walk down through the slums of Philadelphia, to see the rotten, corrupt person and say, gee, I wouldn't want to walk down this street at night. They might hit me over the head, snatch my pocketbook, you know, the crimes that are going on in Philadelphia, and see, that may be Jesus in one of those people. And I must help him in Jesus' name. Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Inasmuch as you've not done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've not done it unto me. The next time someone gets in your way and you see him sin scarred and face bloated and says, Mister, can you spare me a quarter? Say in your heart, now Jesus Christ may be here and in ministering to this man in Jesus' name, he counts it as though I'm ministering in his name. Or to someone, I won't believe that for a moment. That's either a demon-possessed man or a godless reprobate under the oh, curse of God. And if he's in that predicament, he bought and paid for it. And I'm sort of glad and I'll shove him a little on his way. Yes, I know there are even Christians that do this. I went to speak in Buffalo, New York, and I met the chaplain of the state penitentiary. And I went with him one day out to the state penitentiary to speak, and I spoke, and he said, one of our greatest problems are the people here that come to hold prison meetings. He said, you know, it's very terrible. He said, you got, and he mentioned different groups like Christian businessmen and other groups that came out, 
to hold meetings as they come out and they sing and they go around and pass out tracts. But he said, they don't love these men. They're sort of there saying, well, fellas, we've got it made and you're there and we just want to tell you that all you have to do is believe and everything will be all right. He says, but they don't love these men. And he said, here's a man that's behind bars and he'll say to a fella, look, could I have your name and address? I'd like to write you. And the man says, yes. And he writes down his name and address and gives it. And the man writes him a letter. The prisoner writes and says, I'm going to get out in a month. And I don't know where to go or what to do. Can you help me? And he said, that letter goes out. And the chaplain said, I censor all the letters. And I know everything that goes. And he said, I know when I put that letter in the mail and send it out that it's never going to be answered. He says, these song singers that come and rant and rave and testify Jesus saves and keeps and satisfies, he said, they won't turn their hand over to love and help the man that's coming out of prison. He says, they won't give themselves in love. Ah, oh, this is the tragedy. We do not understand that Christianity is not testifying and singing. Christianity is loving. Christianity is getting down to the level of the man that needs and helping him. I, I still am full of the article I read by the national from South America who writes of the missionaries that come down and that say, we want help uh, so that we can send our little girl to kindergarten up in the United States because things are so bad down here in South America. So they write to their prayer list letters to get the money for the girl to go to kindergarten. Instead of keeping her down there and sending her to kindergarten and school there. What, in South America? Yes. Believe me, if I were on a mission board, I would not send anybody to the mission field that was not willing to give up United States passport and become a Brazilian or a Chileno or a Peruvian or an Ecuadorian. If you're going to be a minister and a missionary, go be the word made flesh. Adopt their type of life. Give up your automobile. Go into a small house. Take a bicycle. Live in their conditions and live like them. And for anybody to go down as a missionary and say, we have to maintain our American standard of living, totally to fail to understand what it means to be the word made flesh dwelling among men. Oh, let me say this more and more importantly to any of you who think of going to the mission field. You must be the word made flat, dwelling among men. On their level, on their level, knowing and loving them. Trevor Shaw said to me that a black man whom he knows well in Africa, and the black men know him and love him, and confide in him, and come with their troubles. And one of the black men said to him, almost as though he were black, and understood them, said, well, you know, any missionary that comes here, we judge them within an hour after he gets off the boat. We know whether he's one of two kinds, because there are two kinds of missionaries. There's the missionary that's up here, and the blacks are all down here, and he condescends. Now, we're Americans, and we have radio, television, automobiles, elevators, high buildings, highways, and a modern civilization, and you're cannibalistic savages, and you learn from us. Then there's another kind that comes down and wants to live on their level and love them and realize that they have a civilization. Because, brother, let me tell you, you'd say, why, if you took them and put them in the heart of this city, they wouldn't know what to do. They can't drive a car, they can't do anything. Well, if you took you and put you in the heart of a jungle, a monkey would get you before 30 minutes. You don't know how to live in a jungle. Well, they know how to live in a jungle. And that's just as important to them as living in Philadelphia is important to you. And there has to be this entire readjustment. Now, in the midst of this world that crucified Christ, the Lord God Almighty says, I've put you here. And this whole conflict, you living in Philadelphia, all of your riches in heaven, Christ in heaven, I put you here so that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church by our corporate way of working, by the way we stand together against the evils of the world, and by our individual life, the way we live among men, that we have understood that we're not here to get but to give. Or we're not here to seem to be something, but we're here to be the love of Christ reaching out his hand to those round about us. Now the context of this passage is this. In the third chapter, for this cause, because we're being built upon the foundation of Christ, 
into the great edifice which is the church. I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, for you all, if you've heard of the dispensation, the way of management, the Greek word is the house law, literally, the house rules. If you've heard of the way that God is doing things in the grace of God, the way he's apportioning out the grace of God which is given to me for you, if you knew that how by revelation, by the unveiling of God, he made known unto me this mysterion, this secret. Now, mystery does not mean something mysterious. It has come in English to mean something mysterious. And a mystery is, who killed the man? Did the butler do it? Can you guess the same way that the writer of the Who Done It guesses when he presents his detective story? But in the Bible, a mysterion, a mystery, is something that everybody can know, but which once nobody knew. It's a secret. I can give you the perfect illustration of what the mysterion is. Many, many years ago, we had a secretary working for us, and her name was Elizabeth Haven. And we had a young man who was studying in the Westminster Theological Seminary, and his name was Max Lathrop. And they went to church here together, and nobody ever knew that they'd even dated. Nobody knew it. One Sunday morning, I arrived and came in the side door, and I hadn't gotten out of my car before somebody came to me and said, Did you know Max and Elizabeth are engaged to be married? I shook my head. I had never even imagined. I'd never even seen them in my mind together. I came up the steps of the church. Somebody, did you know Max and Elizabeth are engaged? And I walked across the prayer meeting room towards my office, which at that time used to be in this corner of the building. Max and Elizabeth are engaged. And I went in the room. There was Elizabeth grinning ear from ear. And I said, I've heard it from four people already. I said, is it true? She said, yes, it's true. Well, it had been a mysterion. Believe me, it was now uh, the, what a mystery really is. Everybody knew it. It had been secret, so secret that up till Saturday night, Nobody knew about it, but by Sunday morning, everybody. I never knew an item to go so fast from so many babbling lips. Now, this is what the Bible means by a mysterion. There are 13 of them in the New Testament, and they bear study. Someday, if the Lord gives me time, I hope to write a book on these 13 mysterion, the mysteries of things that were once hidden that nobody knew that nobody in the Old Testament knew, that were never imagined in the days of Moses, that Isaiah never dreamed of, that were not to be found in David, that even when these men of the Old Testament wrote a verse about something, they thought that it was referring to their times and their generations. And God, the marvelous master of using a sentence in two absolutely different ways, had them write a sentence which applied perfectly to their day and which applied perfectly to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he said, I want you to know that by revelation this secret is now made known to me. The veil is taken off, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge of this mysterion, this revealed secret that everybody can now know. What is it? Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the scripture. That Americans should be saved. Dirty, low-down, pagan outcasts of devil worshippers, your ancestors and mine, who were with a sneer, the uncircumcision. Well, someone says, well, Dr. Barnhouse, this is not patriotic. When God saves an American, why, this is sort of something super special for heaven. Don't you believe it? Go back and remember that in chapter 2 and verse 11 it says, Remember that in that time you were Gentiles. And that at that time you were without God, without hope, and without Christ. Godless, hopeless, and Christless. And Paul says the mystery was that God in his promises to the Jews was going to enlarge it to include us. That God was going to stoop down to take people of those whom God had given up, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. To a reprobate mind outside of God, God says, I'm going to reach down and save them. And Gentiles can be in this too. Oh, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. But remember that there are certain ideas that are false. Namely, 
that the church is more important in the mind of God than the Jews, and that the Jews sort of get all the crumbs that fall from the church's table, but it is just the other way around. Anything that we get are crumbs that have fallen from the Jews' table. The Jews come first in the mind of God, before the church. And while it's true that in our age the Gentiles are fellow heirs, simply because we have become in the majority, that should not cause us to forget that we are nevertheless the second comers, and that we sit down at the table with Abraham, and he's at the head table. There is no promise that is made to us that is not also made to the spiritual believer in Christ in Isaiah's time and Moses' time. Moses and David and Isaiah and John the Baptist are going to have just as great a place in heaven as anyone saved in this age. And the Jews who are of future times, all of us are blessed with faithful Abraham. He got it first. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And now there comes this great mystery. And what I'm trying to bring to your mind is that we should definitely understand as we approach verses like this, amazing grace, how sweet a sound that saved a wretch like me. For I was a dog of a Gentile. I had no right. God hadn't even made a promise to us. God had made promises to Abraham and his seed, but you can't find any promise in the Bible where God had promised that a Gentile could come and say, Lord God, there's a promise made to Gentiles, and I have a right to come on this. No, 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 this isn't there. We must understand this, that this was a mystery, and it was never known before, but now it's known. We Gentiles have a chance. We can get into heaven, which belongs first of all to the Jews. And we accept that which comes by the grace of God, but we get it on the basis of the fact that God made promises to Abraham and Israel. And then later, he lifted the veil and said, you Gentiles can come in too. This was the mystery. Partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. Paul, what are you talking about? Everybody thinks you're a tough dog in the whole thing. Oh, says Paul, I'm less than the least of all the saints. And here, by the way, is a great illustration of what true repentance is. Oh, what a maligned word. You have people going to a rescue mission and saying to lost souls, you must repent. Well, there is a sense in which you can command repentance of the unsaved man, but don't forget this, that nobody knows anything about repentance until after he has been saved. At the beginning I said, I trust myself, and I don't trust God, and about face I no longer trust myself, and I build my hope on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Yes, yes, it's easy to say, but believe me, this coming to the place where you do not trust yourself and build your hope by wholly built on Jesus' name, it's a slow process. There are a lot of you people that have got all the words in your mouth, but do not have them yet in your heart, that I do not trust myself. I do not judge, yes, says Paul, I don't even judge my own self. Because when I make a choice, when I do something, it may look unselfish, but it may be that the old nature down underneath still has its angle. But oh, when we understand the great truth that it's going to take a great many years before you can see the abyss of your own heart. Have I told you recently, we came once with my children to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. I had wanted to arrive there in time to let them see the Grand Canyon in sunset, but the road was gravel coming down from Bryce Canyon, and we had to go about 30 miles an hour where I had hoped to go 50, 60, and finally we got in at 9 or 10 o'clock at night and it was dark. Our cabin was a few yards from the rim of the canyon, and just before we went in to sleep, I took the children out to the rail there and I said, it's a mile down to the river, one mile down. And you see those lights there to the north? That's the north rim, and it's 
13 miles away. And we set the alarm clock for a little while before sunrise. We went out, and it was black, black, black. And as we went and stood there, suddenly, far away, 70 miles perhaps, the sun hit the tip of San Francisco Peaks. And the sunrise, instead of beginning down here, began up on top of the peaks, because the sun was over there. And these peaks were way up in the air, and they got it first. And as the sun rose, you see, the light began to come down the hill, and the light came down. And after half an hour, we began to see dimly the buildings across on the other side of the Grand Canyon. But still, the Grand Canyon itself, you couldn't see a thing. Even though it was fully bathed in sunlight on the mountains, the Grand Canyon was as black as midnight. And then, a half an hour later, you could begin to see down in the canyon, oh, 200 yards down and a little more. But it was two hours before you could see the river. It took two hours before sunrise came to that bottom place. Well, now, this is repentance. This is the way we grow in the Christian life. We get saved. Oh, we say, praise God, I'm saved. See the sunlight on the peak of the resurrection. And in the Bible, it says, you've got a black heart. Yes, I've got a black heart, but you don't really believe it. I'm really terrible, but I really think I'm pretty nice. And... Oh, that's the same as amen in a Pentecostal meeting. That's public confession, mass guilt. When you laughed at that, it showed that fundamentally down deep you do think you're pretty nice. In other words, the sun hasn't risen far enough for you to see down in the dark of the black canyon of your own heart and life. 